The United States working to protect against our adversaries. Welcome to Faith Nation. I'm Jenna Browder. America is back. That's what President Biden told our allies when he took office. But after this year's nightmare withdrawal from Afghanistan, many world partners are questioning that statement. And America's adversaries are taking advantage, testing U.S. resolve. National Security Correspondent Caitlin Burke has our top story. America is in damage control, and our enemies are taking advantage by going on the offensive. We have Iran resuming oil shipments to both Afghanistan and Lebanon in open defiance of the administration. Some sort of bizarre attack on the vice president's uh, traveling party in Singapore. Uh, it seems like it's open season on American interests. Not to mention increased pressure from China on Taiwan and Hamas firing rockets on Israel. Victoria Coates, a member of President Trump's National Security Council, says this goes beyond just testing a new administration. Thanks to the message the botched Afghanistan withdrawal is sending our adversaries. Across the board, this is just a, a terrible uh, signal of American weakness. And our enemies are making the most of it. China points to the failure as another sign of American decline, using an op-ed to warn Taiwan that if war breaks out, the U.S. military won't come to their aid. Russia also using the hasty retreat to sow seeds of doubt. Vladimir Putin's top national security advisor claiming that America will abandon Ukraine just as they did Afghanistan. Oh, Brett Bruin, the director of global engagement in the Obama White House, says America's foreign policy is changing. One of the things that I was really pressing for when I worked in the Obama White House was this idea that America needs a, a new story for the world. Roosevelt, Churchill, Reagan gave the world and gave Americans a sense of who we are and what we were doing. And right now, and it was, you know, under President Obama, it was under President Trump, and now under President Biden, we don't have that meta narrative. With more foreign policy challenges ahead, both Coates and Bruin say it's time for a shakeup of Biden's national security team. He's got to get some new leadership in there. He's got to reassure. Uh, both folks here in Washington, as well as in foreign capitals, that the right team is in place, that they have learned the lessons of what went wrong with Afghanistan, and that going forward, we are going to be a, a more reliable partner. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. All right, thank you, Caitlin. In China, Big Brother is. More than 415 million surveillance cameras track the population there 24-7. And that's not all. Add digital currency, social security cards, monitored smartphones, and more. And you have what's being called the perfect police state. George Thomas reports. In 2013, China's President Xi Jinping said that whoever controls data has the upper hand. Ever since, Xi has been on a technological quest to build what some call a blueprint for a digital dictatorship. It would not only allow China's communist government to control huge volumes of data on its own citizens, but also of those around the world. Dustin Carmack worked as chief of staff for the director of national intelligence. You're talking that, you know, vast amounts of data. They are running between both either covert or overt, you know, cyber attacks and other realms. They are sucking up massive amounts of data around the globe that could have nefarious purposes in the long run. China has more than 415 million surveillance cameras deployed throughout the country, making its population by far the world's most watched. And now Beijing is using digital currency, social security cards, social credit systems and online interactions to keep an even closer eye on its citizens. It is a massive dragnet based on artificial intelligence, uh, facial recognition, voice recognition. These are all novel technologies that the Chinese Communist Party is deploying against its people. Jeffrey Kane, author of the new book, The Perfect Police State, an undercover odyssey into China's terrifying surveillance dystopia of the future, says the regime first tested this type of surveillance several years ago to monitor Uyghurs, an ethnic Muslim group living in the western part of the country. It's a place where everything they do from morning to night, from the, from the moment that they eat breakfast or go to the market or go to work, 
everything is monitored by their smartphones, by, by government cameras everywhere. There are millions of government cameras in this region. Um, and nothing is private, nothing is secret. Your entire life is exposed. Kane says his investigation found that those reams of data are fed to a massive police database. And with the help of artificial intelligence, attempts to predict whether or not someone will commit a crime in the future. But the thing is that the system has gotten out of control because, uh, you know, it, so I, I looked at a list of reasons that people can be detained for these pre-crimes. Um, and, you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, they, they bought a tent suddenly or they, you know, they stopped smoking suddenly. Um, they, they change their behavior in ways that the system finds odd. And then so it nudges the police, it sends the police a little, um, you know, on the app, a, a nudge to, you know, go to this person's house, to their work, to check them out, maybe interrogate them a little bit. And if the situation calls for it, take them away to one of many hundreds of concentration camps. China is accused of committing genocide against the Uyghurs by holding more than a million of them in what Beijing calls re-education camps. The Associated Press gaining exclusive access to one such detention center this summer that allegedly had room enough to hold more than 10,000 prisoners. When we talk about genocide, it's not just about taking lives, which there's evidence to suggest that's occurring too, but it's to erase a population, an ethnic group, and that's what they're after. Sophie Richardson with Human Rights Watch says President Xi also wants China to be the global leader in exporting its authoritarian surveillance tech to other like-minded regimes. And so when they've got the kinds of tools that allow them, for example, to track their critics' uh, every movement and control their access, for example, to money or even to buying plane or train tickets, you know, it, makes, it, make, it can make a state exponentially more powerful. New research from Oxford University and Berlin's Humboldt University uncovered some 1,800 active Chinese surveillance devices across 72 countries including Venezuela, Kenya, Philippines, and Oman. China is now using their influence, their money, uh, their technology to facilitate the repression of minorities and, and individuals in other countries. China has also deployed censorship devices in 17 other countries, among them Turkey, Cuba, Egypt, and Pakistan, where news and media websites are blocked. I think the overall effect is to use technology to engineer a very particular kind of dissent-free society, and that's a very frightening concept. China used these and other tactics to suppress protesters in Hong Kong, then came to Cuba's aid in July by cutting communications after tens of thousands took to the streets protesting the regime. That type of technology being used to, to throttle uh, internet traffic flows or at times uh, in Cuba actually turn off the internet, especially in the early days of some of the protests down there. Meanwhile, new research shows that technology made by seven American companies, including IBM, Microsoft and Oracle, are facilitating China's surveillance of Uyghur Muslims with little to no consequences. I think that a lot of American companies have been caught with their pants down, frankly, because um, they spent the past two decades warming up to China, looking for market and business opportunities, profit opportunities, um, and now they've realized that they're, they're making a deal with the devil. A deal that is handing China a treasure trove of data in its quest for global information superiority and digital control over its citizens and those around the world. George Thomas, CBN News. Thank you, George. A new type of bioterror has been unleashed on hundreds of Americans. The mysterious syndrome and who's behind these attacks. Next. Welcome back. A mysterious illness has been attacking Americans with nausea, headaches, ringing in the ears, and insomnia. It's called Havana Syndrome, and it struck dozens of our spies and diplomats around the world. So who's behind these attacks? Here again is George Thomas with the details. It was the early morning hours of December 5th, 2017. Mark Polymeropoulos was in his room at the Marriott Hotel close to the U.S. Embassy in downtown Moscow, when suddenly he started to feel very ill. 
and I woke up with with uh, uh, incredible vertigo. The room was spinning. Um, uh, I was I had tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. My you know I was nauseous. I felt like I was going to be sick. Polymeropoulos, a 26-year CIA veteran and decorated covert agent, spent most of his career hunting down Islamic terrorists in the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. He'd been shot at, narrowly escaped rocket fire, and was often in the middle of many other extremely dangerous situations. But nothing, he says, compares to what he experienced that day in Moscow. And I spent a lot of time in some, some really tough places in, in our war zones. This was the most terrifying experience of my life, um, you know, basically because of the unknown, but, but something really, really bad happened to me that day. In the months ahead, he would come to realize that he had suffered from a mysterious microwave radiation attack. It's, it's a weapon that is, that is silent. Um, there is very little kind of signature of it, but it's designed to incapacitate, not to kill. Uh, and it's a pretty insidious type of warfare that we see being used against our, our personnel. The first reported microwave attack happening in Cuba in 2016, affecting some two dozen American and Canadian diplomats. It has since come to be known as Havana syndrome. Victims experience, among other symptoms, nausea, severe headaches, ear ringing, loss of balance, and insomnia. James Lynn, one of the leading experts on the biological impact of microwave attacks, described to CBN News what happens when a pulse blast hits a person. That microwave pulse will be able to produce a sound wave inside the head of a person. And that sound wave would start propagating inside the head and reverberates inside the head. If any tissue damage is going to happen, I believe will come from the reverberation of the sound wave that's been generated inside the brain tissue. Lin says assembling and transporting such a weapon is fairly easy. It's not going to be enormous in size. Uh, I think the size of it uh, could be a full-size car uh, trunk or in a van or uh, uh, SUV. In the five years since that initial attack in Havana, some 200 American diplomats, intelligence, and military officers across multiple continents have been hit by these mysterious symptoms. The Wall Street Journal reporting that in one recent attack in a European capital, a diplomat suffered a brain injury similar to those who had been exposed to shock waves from explosions. Investigators are also looking into two attacks that may have occurred on U.S. soil, one reportedly happening close to the White House. Researchers with the National Academy of Sciences said many of the neurological symptoms were consistent with the effects of directed pulsed radio frequency energy. At first, we thought it was a, a, a fluke, but now it looks like it was more premeditated. The CIA has tapped a veteran agent who helped track down Osama bin Laden to find the source of the microwave attacks. And I said in my confirmation hearing before the Senate that I would make this a very high priority to ensure that my colleagues get the care that they deserve um, and that we get to the bottom of what caused these incidents and who was responsible. The CIA hasn't publicly said who it believes is behind the attacks, but Polymeropoulos has his suspicions. Who do you hold responsible for carrying out this attack against you? You know, look, I, I think the, the conventional wisdom now, and it, it's taken some time to, to reach this conclusion, but within the intelligence community, certainly within, um, you know, the operational elements at, at CIA is that the Russians are behind this. Moscow has denied any involvement. Meanwhile, Senator Susan Collins, along with 14 other Republican and Democratic lawmakers, have introduced the Havana Act. Our bill would provide assistance to the employees of the intelligence community and other federal agencies who have suffered from traumatic brain injuries at the hands of our foreign adversaries. Polymeropoulos welcomes the financial and medical help and says what has happened to him and other American diplomats is an act of war. His illness was so bad that it forced him to quit the CIA. Uh, it's still something that, that really incapacitated me, um, and I, I feel the effects to this day. Retiring in 2019 and now writing about his experience, Polymeropoulos is the author of the new book, Clarity in Crisis, 
where he emphasizes, among other leadership virtues, the importance of humility, something he says he learned about firsthand these past four years. I look in the, I go down to our basement where I have all my intelligence medals, and there's there's multiple copies of the front page of the New York Times based on operations that I ran around the world that no one will ever know about. Um, you know, that's when I was on top of the world. Uh, and now, you know, I have a, I have a headache that never goes away and, and some, you know, some, some serious long-term effects. And so, um, you know, humility is, a, I think, a, a really good trait to have. George Thomas, CBN News. Follow the money, find the terrorists. The effectiveness of sanctions and the war on terror is undeniable. So why is the U.S. reversing course on using them? After 9-11, America went to war on terror. While our attention was focused on U.S. military forces overseas, here at home, the Treasury Department was deploying another weapon to counter the enemy. National Security Correspondent Caitlin Burke uh, takes a closer look at America's financial warriors. In the aftermath of 9-11, the Treasury Department made an important discovery. If you follow the money, you can find the terrorists. And if you disrupt the flow, you can stop the attack. There's this huge uh, gap in between diplomacy and, and military uh, that 90% you know, of our national security uh, issues fall within. And just like that, a department previously investigating money laundering became a major national security and foreign policy player. And we really did develop a whole new uh, approach, a whole new set of tools, a whole new toolbox uh, to put to, at the disposal of the president and of the National Security Council. That resulted in the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. Danny Glasser joined as a junior member at its inception under President Bush. Then, under the Obama administration, he rose to assistant secretary. Over the span of the two administrations, Glasser helped foster an approach that took his department to an even more sophisticated and strategic level. We uh, would focus on a target, whether that target was um, uh, a, a, a group like al-Qaeda or Hezbollah, um, or we would focus on a jurisdiction like Iran and North Korea. We would try to understand what their weaknesses were. We would try to understand um, where we could uh, where we could hurt them, um, and then we would devise uh, and then try to implement a strategy to do just that. The results were undeniable. For example, in 2005, Glasser and his team froze North Korea out of the international financial system, a move that brought the regime to the negotiating table. Which they said, "You found out a way uh, to uh, to hurt us. Um, for the first time, you found out a way to hurt us, and we had." We'd found out a way uh, to reach into Pyongyang and impact the people that we were trying to impact. Successive administrations have learned from one another on how to craft these executive orders, how to conduct financial diplomacy uh, with friends and allies, uh, and, and have built upon that brick by brick, step by step. Marshall Billingsley succeeded Glasser under President Donald Trump. As a part of Trump's maximum pressure campaign, Treasury built upon the economic warfare already waged on countries like Iran. Hezbollah in Lebanon, to Hamas uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, the Gaza Strip, to the Houthis uh, in Yemen. We, as we cut into Iran's terror budget, we choked off huge amounts of revenue streams to these terror groups. Billingsley's team also innovated new forms of economic coercion. They ranged from shutting off Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro's cash access by essentially making the country's bonds worthless, to going after China, a country largely seen as untouchable because of how closely intertwined its economy is with America's. There has been a, a continuous thread of consensus on uh, the concept that uh, choking off illicit revenue through these financial uh, measures is the right thing to do, and, and particularly to do uh, in lieu of having to deploy uh, our armed forces uh, into conflict. That is, until now. Billingsley says rather than building upon these measures taken during the past three administrations, okay, Biden well, seems to be determined to reverse course. Uh, within days of taking office, the first thing, one of the first things the Biden administration did in this regard was to remove the foreign terrorist uh, organization, the FTO as they call it, the foreign terrorist organization designation of the Houthis in Yemen. 
How did the Houthis respond? By a massive upsurge in unmanned aerial vehicle attacks, uh, ballistic missile attacks, and other terror attacks. There's also Iran, where he says the Biden administration is removing financial pressure to get them back into a nuclear deal. And Afghanistan, where the Taliban's Islamic Emirate is the size of Texas, and there are rumblings the Biden administration will recognize it as a legitimate government. But if they do that, they're going to start reversing all of not just the Trump administration financial pressures, but the financial pressure that's existed on the Taliban since 1999. Glasser believes it's still too soon to say what Biden will do to the sanctions program, but doesn't see the new administration veering away from a tool that's provided decades of leverage. Because A, it's been proven effective. B, it's overt so that it's something that could be done that they could point to to demonstrate that they care about a problem. Um, you know, and, and, and C, it's, it's again, it's a, it's, it's a set of tools and authorities that fall in between diplomacy and, 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 and war uh, that is very, very hard to find. Still, history has proven that in order for economic pressure to be effective, it must be employed alongside a clear diplomatic message and reinforced with a credible threat of military action. Not something that critics say we're seeing from the Biden administration. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. The threats facing Christians in North Korea when Faith Nation returns. Finally tonight, North Korea is one of America's biggest adversaries, and it's no secret the regime there has little tolerance for Christianity. But despite the threat facing brutal punishment for their faith, believers aren't losing their hope. You know, it says something about the power of faith, that in the face of that kind of um, uh, just egregious, ongoing, systematic uh, uh, persecution of people for their religious beliefs, people still choose to believe. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom is documenting persecution in North Korea, saying the persecuted there are not forgotten. And that is going to do it for Faith Nation. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.